Oh, beloved, it is getting to the point that every move you make with me knocks my mind out of joint. And I end up paying an exorbitant fee. It is, however, only by your munificent grace am I able to pay. For I completely trust your smiling face. As I gratefully pick up the cost along the way. Of course, I never know whether you pull or whether you push. Or even whether you care I care or not. God knows the next stop may be the Hindu Kush. But knowing you are with me always, I can dismiss the wise or the what's. Being with you every moment becomes a wonder, for I never know what you have in store. Reams of planning, dreams, mental storage shelves are becoming empty and thrown asunder. Instead, the companionship of your presence and the grace you dispense only makes me love you more and more. And yes, still more. Oh, Ambrose, back to my heart, to the tavern you go, pushed or pulled your choice is not. Trust always in me as you move with the flow. For in the earthly life, I am with you at every earthly spot. So hold on tight my garment's hem as you ride this fortune's wheeling sphere and pay not attention to those who praise and those who condemn. Remember, it is you whom I am ever so near. Thank you. It reminds me of a, a story that, <clears throat> and it probably wouldn't necessarily fit into the, when we're reading Effort and Grace, but this is something that Darwin used to share. He was, Baba had him come and work on the center, help to drain the swamps, uh, and uh, at the time, you couldn't get to, into the center from the highway until, until these uh, swamps were drained. Mm -hmm. But anyway, at the end of the day, during the year that he was there, he would go to the property where Baba's house was later built. It was just uh, out and staked out. And he would go to a certain part of the bluff there over on the edge of the lake, and he would look toward... India and think of Baba at the end of the day and he felt he felt Baba answering him you know he felt the exchange but he this is in say 1948 and he um, he didn't um, <clears throat> but you know he wasn't certain you know but he kind of he would do that as a as his habit at the end of the day so then Baba came in 52 <clears throat> and at one point Baba sent called for Darwin and his family to come and see him at his house. And so when they got there, um, <clears throat> Bob was at the door, at the screen door, and he uh, you know, opened a door and greeted them each as they went by. And Darwin was the last one. And as Darwin was uh, about to step through the, the door, Bob uh, gestured out to that place. And, and Darwin said, Bobby, you're reminding me how I used to come and sit there and think of you. So <clears throat> Darwin always said that, you know, never doubt those inner contacts that you have with Baba. Baba, the very place that he would go at the end of these days, back in 1948, four years before, and point out that place. So. And, and Baba was the one who was reminding Darwin of that. Yeah. And yeah. Bob, and, you're reminding me. Yeah. And I remember Darwin, you know, he'd be working a lot, all long hours, and he'd go to that high spot where Baba's house now is. 
and the place where you can look where we have Easter Sunday uh, sunrise, he would go and look out and he always wondered, you know, he could feel Baba there, but he always wondered, does Baba really know I'm here? Yeah. And that's why it was even more significant. Yeah. That Baba then reminded him four years later that in fact, he, he knew he was right with him. Yeah. No. Did Baba come up to him? At one point, and say that. What's that? Yeah, Baba snapped his finger and pointed to the to the place, and then the very he, spot it, there. The very spot. Just as he was the last, and and then Baba just kind of gave him a brand a bland look, you know, like, <laughs> you know, no uh, no big deal. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> no sure big for deal him, for it was no it was no big deal. <laughs> no big deal for me, but. but but I guess it's a, like you say, Jeff, it's a really great example of how, um, you know, Baba really is with us. We, we don't always, as humans, maybe think of it. But in fact, I think the longer we were with Baba, we get affirmation that it's an ongoing living relationship yeah. with Baba. That he, he hears us and he wants us to talk to him. Yeah. 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 Any of those stories that you remember that? Uh, well, just one little, little one. I know we're going to start soon, and I don't want to. And, and if anybody else wants to say hello, but um, I remember one time I had a, you know, a, a heart. I would get attached to people or things, and I remember uh, Gene Shaw was, you know, Darwin. We knew. I mean, he was obviously much more of kind of the mentor, but Gene was more of a hidden men mentor and um, would would work inwardly with people a lot. And we, almost without her knowing what she was doing, it seemed. Yeah. But I remember one time, um, you know, they used to come onto the center and sometimes they'd go and have their lunch by the library porch and one time I rode with them in their car with someone else and we got to the library parking lot and uh, we all got out and we were going to have a little sandwich on the library porch. And um, I got out, you know, got out of the car and I, I, I closed the uh, door, but I didn't want to slam it. So it didn't close all the way. And then Jean had gotten out on the same side and, and she just, you know, she just took the door and gave it a good shove and it closed really well. And she just said, you know, she said, you know, the trick is in letting go. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like one of Jean's little few yeah. words that beautiful that she said that when she said it, it kind of went right into my heart. Yeah. She was very intuitive. Yeah. And very low key about it. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like she was in another world, but yeah, she was. There was that famous story where I think Michael Siegel and Bill Cliff and Rick Dryden and those guys were up. Jean would come down to the center early because she couldn't handle the cold in upstate New York, so she'd come down a good month before, maybe even in February, and then Darwin had to stay to shovel the roof off, and he'd come down a month month later. So they would have meetings still every week. And they were having this, Gene had been down there a couple of weeks and they're having this wonderful meeting and they were just like getting higher and higher and higher. And it's like, everything was building together, Darwin and the folks that were there. Um, and this was probably, I don't know, in the late eighties, you know, mid eighties and and they were just really getting higher and higher and higher. And all of a sudden the phone rings mm -hmm. and Jean, Jean, it's Jean's on the phone, but she doesn't say, you know, hi or anything. She immediately says, what's going on up there? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Darwin in his low key way said, Oh, nothing. We're just having a meeting, you know, and we're all enjoying a meeting. And, and, and Jean just says, well, I think that's enough. 
<laughs> I got a little too high. Because <laughs> they all, and then uh, they all, they did gradually kind of come down a little bit, but they, everyone said they would go out to a, they went out to the colony diner afterwards and they were still flying for hours after that. Yeah. Well, yeah. well let's have a few moments of silence here before we begin. Jay Baba, everyone. <clears throat> Here's why, the way we do it. <clears throat> Angela will uh, randomly uh, pick people to read, uh, and, and you just read a subchapter, and uh, you can pass. And uh, after the reading, anybody wants to make comments or ask questions or uh, give reflections on, on what's there, um, feel free. You know, this is, um, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be a final exam at the end, <laughs> you know, after 84,000 lakhs of lives. But uh, now most of you, um, you know, uh, uh, know Darwin, but some of you don't. I'm just going to say that he wrote this book when he was in his 90s, which is incredible. And he was very, uh, very clear. He used to beat everybody in checkers, even at that age. And, um, <clears throat> but it's, it's about, his, it, in, a, in it, he, it this, uh, it's our journey in, in a consciousness with Baba. He takes us through from the head to the heart and eventually to the soul. And, and I would say that Darwin, in talking with him toward the end of his life, he spent a lot of time at the level of the soul. Uh, and, and so we're getting like a guided tour by someone who is, is not just being academic. He's, he took this journey uh, with Baba. And so uh, <clears throat> we're getting very, uh, <clears throat> we're getting insights from someone who experienced much of this journey. So everybody has their own way, but Darwin has written this in such a way that uh, many of us can relate to <clears throat> what he talks about. And, and like I say, he went through all of this himself. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, why don't we start? Any questions before we begin? Okay. Uh, the right. page number is 22, right? Yes, misprojection. The previous um, one was uh, on uh, misconceptions. And in, in that, Darwin talks about how we, uh, our view of ourself is very distorted. I mean, in fact, he, he gives the analogy of a of binoculars turned around the other way <clears throat> and everything seems small and so when you get into the heart they get it gets turned the other way around and everything is up close and intimate uh hey jeff what age did darwin uh leave his body he was 97 wow up in the dizzy heights yeah what where's dizzy heights no the dizzy heights of uh life Oh, 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 I thought that was a place. I was like, I, I never heard. <laughs> Dizzy Heights, South Carolina. <laughs> Perhaps most of our lives as spiritual seekers is spent consciously or unconsciously trying to correct the latent misconceptions that have been plaguing us from the subconscious level of our minds. When we probe each of our own particular misconceptions to its foundation, we discover that we've been copying with wrong answers or coping, excuse me, with wrong answers for most of our lives. We have accepted the facts, the, as we have accepted as facts, things that are simply not true. We've been brought up with the fundamental misconceptions that creation is real and that we are individual limited creatures. And so, right from the beginning, we take it all for granted. There are many misconceptions that we take to be part of our ordinary lives, 
not realizing that they are misconceptions and that they are distorting our inner awareness. As seekers of truth, we have to see through the misconceptions and what they cause and replace all that with what is nearest what is the nearest we can come to truth itself. We cannot add truth to misconceptions. Misconceptions can conclude the tendency to imagine things and to follow trains of thought. Sometimes before we even get out of bed, a certain train of thought has already left the station. And we are not even aware that this has happened. When we wake up in the morning, the mind gets activated and we, pre we present it with a train of thought, which leads us into other trains of thought, and they produce what becomes the content of our day. So we get involved with the following, we get involved in following these trains of thought, instead of taking control and initiating a wisely chosen train of thought. Misconceptions also can involve low self-esteem, based on an incorrect assessment of who and what we really are. And this is in quotes. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. FT number six is a very profound and philosophically revealing statement. Our everyday thinking, our beliefs, and the limitations that we accept are all part of the bondage that we experience. We start with a conclusion from our subconscious and our observations, then look for signs confirming our conclusion, which in turn solidify that conclusion. Wow, bad trip. J. Bob. Yeah. So any uh, comments? I'll, I'll mention one thing. Uh, I remember I asked, you heard this before, but I asked Darwin one time, what is the biggest mistake the Baba people are making? And he said, uh, they think of themselves as small and they remain small. So this is getting outside the, the spiritual box into even something vaster. So I just find it so interesting, you know, from my own, from my own background experience of the Lutheran religion, of how the religion, and my Catholic friends too, of how religions make us small. They do just the opposite of what Baba wanted. You know, oh. and it's just, it's kind of profound to me to, you know, just enough to just say that. It's pretty, probably, probably really obvious to everybody, but it still is like, it's like dead opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very often, yeah, that's the case. Mm where the form becomes more important than the, the spirit behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Patty Curtis? You know, when you were just saying that, I'm realizing that from the moment we are conce uh, brought into this world, we are given a name which separates us. We're told somebody's our mommy, somebody's our daddy, you're this, you're that, but you're not the oversoul. And it, I mean, it starts, it starts right from the minute we're out and we're introduced to another drop soul that is trying to keep us separate from who we really are. And yet the essence is so, we're so I think the, 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 the infant is so full of essence you know, and then they start defining a toe or a, a you know, we keep reinforcing over and over uh, yeah. or trying to the fact that we are this form. It's, it's amazing that that is the process. Yeah. Crazy. Thank you, J. Bob. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah. Uh, Denny and Steve. Yeah, um, it was to what, uh, backing on segueing what you said, I, I was just watching a YouTube from a physician uh, Dr. Gil uh, Mate is his last name, and he's uh, incorporated spirituality into his medicine practice, uh, similar to what we were talking about. He believes that trauma, everyone has experienced trauma. Not, he works with addicts specifically, but he uh, believes everyone from 
when you're born, maybe the mother was depressed in your body, you know, when she was having you, or there was a bad environment in the hospital uh, setting or in the playpen, especially with, you know, every human being has teachers, bad teachers that told us, you know, we were limited or parents, they were human. You know, that's a lot of that stuff is generational, you know, so he really, his name is Dr. Mate. He's well known. And his um, paradigm is that trauma is everyone has trauma, you know, some more than others, but everyone has trauma and we're on earth and he incorporates spirituality to heal. Uh, and he uh, translates, it's one, I don't know the language, but the translation from one language to, from trauma to wounds, it's actually interchangeable, the same word, wounds to trauma. And we're here on earth, similar to some of Baba's cosmology and what Darwin's saying to heal from our wounds, but it's not easy. That's why I heard you say, uh, a couple of uh, meetings ago, Jeff, spiritual progress is very, very, very slow because it's all these trauma that we have that we're trying to unwind. We're trying to reprogram our minds. And also he mentioned, I'll close with, wrap this up with this. It's in the body. It's not just in the mind. So I can go to all the effort and grace meetings and it's going to help my mind. The new thought, which I, I know Darwin read a lot of Christian science but it's a lot of physicians now, spiritual oriented physicians are focusing on the body. Baba must be doing something with the body. So it's in the nerves, the anxieties. So it's yeah. caught up in the body. So it's a lot, there's a lot going on. It does take pay. I wanted to share that, Jeff. You've heard yeah. that. Yeah. It was Erich that said that, that spiritual progress is very, 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 very gradual. Four varies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. Uh... I wanted to say, based on my own experience, uh, being born a Catholic, I um, was up against some of the best salesmen in the world for 2,000 years. Leave it go at that. <laughs> and you were a salesman for a while, too. Yeah. Yep. 15 years. Anyone else? So um, I think this, uh, this, uh, involution the evolution then the involution is kind of paradoxical because even though we're supposed to be bigger than who we are in terms of being or becoming god um it says at the very beginning that god in the beyond beyond world uh existed and so did the lahar the whim and it was that whim that blew through god in that I, I don't remember the proper name of the state. It's like the unconscious unconscious or something like that. And may God want to know who he is. So therefore we have to go through these experiences that are these, um, uh, con, um, not, uh, what is it? Um, ego state. Uh, what am I thinking of? Not preferential. It's the one, the provisional egos. Um, no through each lifetime in order for God to understand who he is. So we have to go through this. So that is like a, um, a paradox and a dialectic at the same time. Yep. No. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. What did uh, Mark Twain say? A life is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> 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 no, but it's, it, it gets, it gets better. Okay. Uh, One more. Paul Fusco, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm driving, so I don't know who the woman was. I, I apologize, trying to keep my eyes on the road. Um, but um, the, the woman who said about the drop soul being born and then getting the name and the mom and the dad, right, made me think, made me think that when we drop our bodies, right, we get this good scrubbing. You know, you get that, that good Baba scrubbing. I could see him with the old scrub brush out there in that heaven hell state. And we get this good scrubbing and then they, they clothe us in these, this new set of, uh, of refined sanskaras. And then the, the soul enters in, in that new clothing that has to go through what the woman was saying, you know, the name and the this and the that this time, right? But it just made me think of Baba with a scrub brush giving us a good scrubbing in that heaven hell state and then dressing us up and whoosh, there you go again. Yep. Jay Baba. Yep. Little baby Paulie. 
Okay. Misprojection. Maintaining misconceptions applies not only to ourselves. It is interesting to observe that we may be unconsciously accentuating things we have observed in other people instead of inwardly asserting and affirming the truth about their being. We make a mistake if we stereotype people. If we engage in projecting their material side back to them, it will tend to grow in them. This kind of projection embraces the limiting idea that we are all separate individuals instead of the more comprehensive truth that, as Baba says, at the soul level, we are all one. So if we would look for the soul, the ideal self in others, that would become accentuated in them. Emphasizing the soul quality of others can become part of our inner work. On the practical level, we take into account the illusory, sanskaric aspect of people, but at the same time, regard them in the light of their true ideal self, emphasizing that rather than any other side of them, by doing this, we are helping them to remove veils. This means looking upon people as, in the last analysis, spiritual beings really seeking God. To get this perception affirmed, Baba is doing everything. Baba is the doer. I know that for most of us, it takes an effort to project the basic truth about people. But if one can develop this, flex, this more flexible attitude, this benefits not only their consciousness, but our own. Because what we visualize affects our own being. If we visualize weaknesses in others, that reflects on our own consciousness. If we visualize the ideal self of others, we are calling forth the same in ourselves, the truth in our own being. It is not always easy to see the higher side of people, but it is worth trying to do. Around Baba, we would experience this kind of projection from him in a very powerful way. The radiation of Baba's presence has the effect of completely enveloping one's lower nature and calling forth one's higher self. It is not as though he is in a closed box and you are in a closed box and you really do not affect each other. He is truth and reality and he is radiating truth and reality and light and divine love and you are radiating falsehoods and illusion. Something has to give. So when the illusions begin to give way, light begins to dawn, and one begins to experience a deep inner integration and spiritual upliftment. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Anything to say to that? That is one of the curses of being a, a Baba person I found is, is the judgmental side of ourselves. And, um, you know, and here Darwin is giving the antidote for that in, you know, plain, plain English. Yeah. I was particularly impressed with if we look for the soul, the ideal self in others, that would become accentuated in them. It, <clears throat> for me, it's easy to meet somebody where they are projecting they are and doing a dance with them in that spot. I would like to, I'd really like to be able to look for their soul and see that instead of what they project. But I don't know how to do that. Anybody have uh, some uh, response to that? 
there's yeah this. you take someone like hitler um <laughs> who's like you know to my mind the embodiment of evil but he was a vegetarian he didn't believe in killing animals he didn't mind killing six million jews um but he didn't want to kill any animals and eat them and he was a painter so i mean we can find a few good things about him and baba did say he was doing his work and we don't understand exactly what that means yeah he, he's a real test <laughs> yeah finding a soul in there and i love that that's so powerful and um it makes me think of the the brian darnell song that i love to sing um not just roses on a string, but like we should leave all of our junk and our garbage and our sins and our, you know, all of that stuff at Baba's feet because in his eyes, everything about us is beautiful and perfect because we're his excellent, impeccable creation. And it's so, you know, our mind can't quite wrap it around that. We think we're just like, well, you know, we look at people doing crappy things and we think you suck you're a bad person oh i just did something crappy i suck i'm a bad person or we can't tolerate weaknesses in ourselves and others and um but if we start th thinking from the lens of baba that you know those weaknesses are what make us vulnerable and what make us fall to his feet or what make us you know penetrable for his love to enter and you know take over us and the more we I guess stumble in our weaknesses, the more susceptible we are to Baba's picking us up and and taking over our lives. So it's actually like a beautiful thing when we're weak and fail, failing. And I'm trying to see that more in others too. Uh, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what's up. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Any? Uh, Cindy, go ahead. Um, what I was, I was thinking about the um, weaknesses, like if we visualize that from the, just the paragraphs before on 21, 22, like when we direct our attention to the weakness of others, it highlights our weaknesses. It, it, it weakens us. And that would be like backbiting and what Baba says about that. And then I also thought that some of what we experience as our lower self nature is happening because people around us are reflecting are visualizing our weaknesses. And it kind of, you know, it can kind of call out more of that in the in environment. And I was thinking about just praying to Baba to purify all of that, all of how we get stuck in like the gopher game of, you know, eliciting each other's weaknesses rather than our highest self. Yep, very good. Um, and Ellen. So um, to, to Anne, I just like to speak to um, what she was, when she asked the question, um, you know, I, for, for me personally, I would say that uh, on a daily basis for work, I have to speak to a, a vast array of people, a lot of people who are um, upset with things that are going on in their um, their place that they're renting you know uh, maintenance so i'm on the phone with these people a lot of the time and a lot of the time their instinct is to go straight into projecting a lot of anger and a lot of um just feeling not well and 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 scared and want and i'm the first point of contact so um uh, many times it's been more than just biting my tongue and just being like, well, I need to be kind because they're Baba. You know, it, it's, it becomes so intense. The projection, I feel it so intensely, their anger or their hate or their whatever it is. I feel it burning and scathing in my own heart. But one thing I remember and that I know that because I've experienced it is that this feeling, this experience cannot be the ultimate truth. And if that's not the ultimate truth, then I know, like Darwin says, this is Baba helping me. This is Baba right now doing what he needs to do. Thank you, Baba. I mean, if in the moment while I'm speaking, there's the recognition that this is Baba doing this. And in that 
recognition. It's sort of like when he talks about shifting the perception, shifting that veil from <clears throat> you're somebody I need to defend against. I need to figure my way out against this. This is, you know, obviously that still happens, but sometimes there's that window and it's Baba's grace where you just say, okay, Baba. And, and just recognizing for me that this is Baba doing this. This is Baba that brought me exactly in this moment with this person in this scenario. Just that helps me. I find the words that come out of me, the things I say, the way I act is the way that Baba would want me to do that because it just naturally happens. I, I couldn't have even thought of, of the thing I said that actually made the conversation end up being in a mutual respect, in a mutual loving space, when at first it was just, just so much, you know, uh, and, and I think that for me, I just see that over and over on a daily basis, how remembering this is just that very, very, very thin, like this is Baba. And then it's just, it, I don't know, it takes me out of my own personal, like, you're, you're talking to me like that, you know? So yeah. um, I don't know. That's, that's just my, I just wanted, I just felt like saying that. Thank you for, for listening. Jay Bob. Yeah. Great. Alan. Beautiful. You know, I, well, I'll just mention one thing. I could always tell who had gone to see Kitty uh, because when they came back on the center, they were just beaming and so, so lit up, you know, so they would, Kitty would somehow affirm the, the larger side of themselves. And I could say, wow, because I could see what they look like, their body language when they went over. And then I would see them when they came back. And they would just be, you know, feeling like a million dollars, you know. It's beautiful. Projecting the, lar the, the real larger self on somebody. Yeah. Go ahead, Gail. Okay, thanks. Um Seeing people's lower nature is the low-hanging fruit. It's the easiest thing to see. Is this person's angry or... Um, <laughs> and I had no idea how much I... And just sticking with the low-hanging fruit, I was um, bringing that into my consciousness, my, my body. Um, and when Dar Darwin suggests it's worth trying to see the higher side, that's the effort. The effort part of effort and grace is yeah. making that effort to see beyond, okay, that's an apple tree. Okay, see beyond um, into the soul of a person, um, what else might be there that um, I don't take the time. So this is, is, and it's helpful. These are such good instructions. Uh, this is something I could do. Um, there are things I can't do, but this some, is something that I could do. So I'm grateful for the suggestion, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Pass and, on the rotten fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake and Clan. <laughs> this um, this passage makes me think of the quote from uh, Jane Haynes, and, I, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember the quote exactly. But uh, she, one of my favorite lines that she, I've heard is she would say, "Baba is the only man that loves me." not in spite of my flaws, but for my flaws. And that particular saying, so for me, so encapsulates how complete Baba's love is. And that when I'm with someone who might be expressing their lower self, how I sometimes view it as, okay, my, my role to love them is to grin and bear their flaws, to try to find that glint of, of light in their soul or, or glint of light in who they really are. But even that in itself, while it's beautiful and important, the, the next thing is to then be able to love them even for the lower self qualities that they are portraying. That's how complete real love is. It just, it's something that very much touches my heart and uh, makes me smile. <laughs> beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Kathy, go ahead. Um, I'm going back to when Anne was at what Anne was saying, you know, about um, when you're sitting with someone to be able to see their soul instead of what, what they're personifying at the time. And for me, what I have found if I'm being with somebody, whether whether they're happy or sad or angry, 
if I focus more on the feeling of their heart, like they're literally a visceral feeling of their heart, then, then it's like, it's almost the words become sweetened, even if the words are harsh, you know, depending upon a person's mood. But somehow when I remember to do that, and believe me, I don't always remember to do that. But when I do remember to do that, it, there, it, it's just, it's almost like the hearts automatically connect. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Mm. This is one of the major challenges in this life. Yeah. And Ruth, go ahead. Hi. Um, I just read across this and I thought I'd mention it right now. It says, um, it's by Rumi, and it says, half of life is lost in charming others, the other half is lost in going through anxieties caused by others. Leave this play. You have played enough. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff and others, I want to ask a question about seeing the person's soul, but I know Hitler was mentioned by Tina and other references toward evil. Can you share what Baba said in some depth? He had to be asked by people, by the way, there were 4 million Christians along with the 6 million Jews that were murdered by the Hitler regime. It wasn't just 6 million Jews, 3 million Polish Catholics and another million Christians. So we're talking about a huge number of people. Can you go into some depth how Baba spoke about Hitler and the Holocaust as part of the divine plan. I ask you the question because maybe by hearing his depth of insight, it would help me to be less judgmental because I've been around some very tough people in my life, very tough people who threatened me from the mafia. And when you're around these people, not that I associate with them, I'm a nice Jewish guy from Queens, but Somebody didn't think I was such a nice guy. And eventually we spoke and he realized he was in a lot of projections about me. I were reconciled to the point yeah, he wanted yeah. to bring me to Naples to be the guest of his family. But I took a pass on that. But in terms of Adolf Hitler and the regime, yeah. what did Baba say that was enlightening and gave people a depth of even love and acceptance toward the Holocaust and Hitler? How did Baba unpack that very good question now uh this anyone uh anyone to respond i mean i have some things to say but um uh, anyone can answer jeff here uh go ahead and the things he said was that he would never allow war. And I take it at the time he was saying that, that he was talking about the Second World War, but also all wars. If it weren't for the benefit for those who could step forward and in their ordinary lives not have a chance to utilize their soul qualities, to, to go beyond the ordinary, and then we see so many people in the Holocaust who went above and beyond to help others. And one of the things that Baba said also was that the souls from the Holocaust all came to the Samadhi. This was before he dropped his body, of course, but the women were living there at the time up on the hill and they were singing the seven names of God constantly. That's what they did. And he said, the souls from the Holocaust came and heard the seven names of God being sung by these women and then went on. And we have lots of them who have come back as Baba lovers this lifetime. I also talked to somebody just a couple of days ago who was a German soldier and he is a Baba lover now. I think Baba 
used that to help so many souls move forward. I don't know if that helps, Jeff, but. I appreciate what you're saying, Ann. And my question is much more toward the 10 million, all of them suffered death in the most brutal ways, throwing babies up and catching them on bayonets, telling the Jews when they said, where are we going? You'll be up in smoke like that other group that just went in, just on a psychological level to torture. I've heard Holocaust survivors talk about what they went through and how they were able to finally endure. I don't want to have a visceral pain in people hearing any more details than that, but why did these people die? How did Baba, and I'm sure Baba had the impeccable ability, not taking away anything you said, Ian, I appreciate what you said, that they came to the Samadhi in the soul form, but how did Baba explain that this was intended by God to happen? I, I, I've thought of this question for years, and I, I'm, I want to hear your answers, whatever they may be. It may not really give me the answer I'm looking for, but whatever Baba said in addition to that in terms of how could this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Extraordinary, extraordinary brutality. We can't even imagine being squished in a chamber, hundreds of people. The gas goes yeah. on, and the yeah. pain of the death, extraordinary suffering. Million after million after million. I can't even say the number of millions. It'll take too much time. But yeah, well, yeah. No. yeah let's see. Um, um, this is Jeff. I'm not really answering what can you hear me? Yeah. Am I, okay. Yeah. What, what you said exactly. I wanted to first respond to Alan's comment and then I have a thought on yours, but um, one of the things, one of the biggest gifts that Baba has given us to um, keep the focus of, of love and him. And, you know, if, if bad energy is coming, if we want to, um, you know, n not deflect it, but to reflect it into a positive way is the power of his name. And, um, and my mind cannot conceive any of the, the magnitude of the suffering that has happened in this world, not just with the Holocaust, but genocide worldwide, blah, blah, blah. And the only, um, not the only, but one of the best tools we have is saying Baba's name it's it's more powerful than anything and um i think it has the power to transform us from the depths you know um and and others around us they have no idea why they're feeling uplifted um you you, you don't have to let anybody know you know it's it's internal but i i think it's one of our best best tools we have yeah, I've got something uh, later on, maybe, or some uh, future time, uh, Darwin and Baba's name that you might find interesting. Yeah. But anyone else? To, uh, oh, yeah, there's, Jeff's, there's, there's yeah. a lot of hands up. So we'll yeah. see if they're answering Jeff directly. But uh, Daniel Stone, go ahead. So, um, you know, I was, I was reminded with Jeff's question, um, when I first went to India in 1972, and I think the question that, that I hear Jeff asking is, I think, a question that many of us have asked and have really tried to wrestle with. And it's, it's a very fundamental question about how can God allow, if God is all good, how does he allow all these horrible things to go on that we know go on? Um, and I remember asking that question to Eric in Mundley Hall, and Eric was response to Like, you know, well, um, you, know, you know, essentially, um, you know, Hitler was doing Baba's work, which is, you know, it's very easy to almost trivialize these kinds of questions with answers like that. And I don't, and I, I'm very cautious about doing that. And then after that happened, Arnavaz came out to me on the porch to try to clarify that because she was aware of how sensitive that issue is and how, 
uh, how uh, how distressing it might be to hear that the that somebody like Hitler is doing Baba's work. But um, and she was trying to explain, you know, this is that these things happen because they are the vehicles for people to work out their karma, and that they happen at a mass scale because they're mass kinds of things that happen that require mass responses for karmic, you know, for karmic, uh, to be worked out karmically. So I wanted to read something that was circulated recently um, that, that is directly relevant to this. Uh, it was a letter that Baba wrote to a man named Walter Mertens. Walter Mertens was a follower of Baba who lived in Switzerland and had a lot of contact with Baba. Baba spent time at his home in Switzerland. And um, he wrote this in 1935, which is when a time when all the, you know, the forces of darkness were all gathering in Europe and so on. And it must have been a very, very dark time to be there. And I'm just going to read an excerpt, though there's actually a lot of other interesting things in this letter. But just to say, Baba said uh, to him, uh, uh, I know how affairs are rather difficult to manage, yet how patiently you carry on. That's the best way never to worry, but to meet the situations and try your best to pull on as guided intuitively. And this is the part that's relevant. Difficulties there are all over the world in all phases and problems of life, some of which have actually crushed not thousands, but millions. But this is all a reaction of people's own doing and must be faced. And I think that that's, you know, Baba didn't, I don't think Baba explained things, um, you know, all the time about kind of why he did or why things happened like that. But I think in that one sentence, I think Baba essentially says, says it. He says, you know, that people accrue karma and the karma has to be repaid and it can be extremely difficult karma and it can, ex you know, repaid in extremely difficult circumstances and that's, that is the process of evolution of, con of that's a, the evolution of the soul. So, um, so, and to me, that's, you know, that's the, that's the really simple answer to the question of why are all these people going through it is, is because they're paying back their karmic debts for whatever reason they've, for whatever reason they've gotten them. And it's not a justification for being insensitive about it or for not trying to do things to try to ameliorate it or mitigate it, but it is a way of understanding it that, I, that Baba gave us. So I offer that. Good, thanks, yeah. And Jack had his hand up. Yeah, I, I can actually uh, point you to the place that this was said. Uh, you, Jeff, this is for Jeff. You might check with David Fenster or Eric Salabaki but I know for a fact Baba did say that the uh, Holocaust, in other words, uh, lifted the race karma of the entire Jewish race. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, we talk about Jesus as the redeemer of karma, which is his crucifixion did for that period into BC, however far it goes. That was done, and now we have Baba in this past century doing the same thing for the Jewish race. Uh, there's no answer, uh, in my mind, in my opinion, it's only the quest. So you might look into that. Thank you. Great topics, right? Especially a, a topic like this on Easter Sunday. And again, this is the Orthodox Easter, which means they follow um, the lunar calendar. So it has to come for them after Passover, right? So that there's a chronological sequence. But that being said, that being said, um, you have the crucifixion that was just brought up, right? <clears throat> and the suffering and the brutality to God himself in human form, right? That's number one. And the reasons that, that you know, follow with all of that is because Baba, everything is happening within Baba, all of it. 
and he partakes in that suffering. And I think it was Bao who said that Baba said, um, the crucifixion is the part that needed to be seen, but how the avatar suffers every moment is what we don't see. And that's because the antithesis of light is darkness. And both of them, the Alpha and the Omega, are both within, right? But the, the Avatar, the God-man, participates, takes on that suffering with us. It's not just us suffering, but it's him suffering. And so he takes that. That is why he comes into his creation. That's why he takes all of that. And the last thing is, when someone asks Baba, why do you allow war? <laughs> he said, how do, you, how do you make sugar cane? And they said, well, Baba, no, 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 we're talking about war. And he says, well, I, I'm answering you. How, how do you make sugar cane? He says, well, you, you, know, you take the husks off and you throw it into a cauldron of boiling water. And then all of the, the, the gook and the muck comes up to the surface and you ladle it off and you're left with pure sugar cane. And Baba says, that's why I allow war. I take all that energy and I take it and I transform it in my universal love and put it back into the creation. Yes, there's atrocities, pandemics, everything. But we don't suffer this alone. We suffer as he suffers. Jay Meher Baba. Good, very good. Hey, uh, Jeff, I've got... The very question Baba was asked, this is back in the 30s, why is there so much evil in the world? Baba was asked that. Baba said, it is as one takes it. In reality, there is nothing but God, good, and bliss. But because of ignorance, man doesn't see it and takes the different degrees of expressions of good as evil. Even so, it is essential for the even so, it is essential for the eradication of duality. Passing through different phases and experiences of this duality, man evolves in consciousness and understanding of the one reality which alone exists. That was Baba's answer. Now, I want to just say one other thing. People say, well. Hitler did Baba's work. No, I always took it from the Mandalay. <clears throat> he organized the powers of darkness so that they could be, they got them all in one place so they could be taken on. It wasn't like any noble thing that he did. He just <laughs> managed to get all of them uh, in one location so that this whole world war could take place and maybe hopefully eradicate uh, a lot of what was in there in people. But anyway, there are more hands, I'm sure. So I, I remember, and it must have been after Darwin moved to uh, Myrtle Beach in 89, but it was like he was, he was up visiting, I think a short time, but or it was the time of the Gulf War. And we met at the Dryden farm, where Rick Dryden's house. And he, um, we were all there beforehand and Darwin came maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes later. And, and we were all kind of upset about the Gulf War. And um, so we got very kind of philosophical about it and kind of, you know, many people were were getting killed and the Iraqi uh, people were getting killed. And um, we got a little philosophical and um, that this must be Baba's will and whatever. We didn't know the reason, but it must be um, a good reason and a necessary reason. And then Darwin came and, you know, as we started the meeting, he immediately said something like, um, as we held like a little bit of, you might say a prayer beforehand, he said, and with great compassion, he said, and we pray for all the, the souls who are affected right now in the, in the Middle East, 
Um, and it was such great compassion. It kind of, we had gotten very philosophical and a bit distant, sort of like what Daniel was saying. But Darwin always kept the, uh, that sense of humanity and it's important that we feel the pain of other people and not, not bypass that at all. So whatever, so much we don't know what, about why this happened or that happened, but I think keeping our hearts open um, and actually feeling others' pain and, and being with them in that, in compassion, is essential part of our path. And I just remember, you know, Darwin's response was quite different than ours. So it really, it struck us all how much he held um, the people with love in his life. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jeff, Asbel. I, um, I appreciate your question. And it's something that um, I was really struggling with for a number of years, um, even before I knew the name Meher Baba. And uh, my family uh, comes from the Armenian genocide. So my great grandparents went through a lot of uh, suffering. Uh, I, I know that Hitler is went on the record of saying he got a lot of his ideas uh, from the Armenian genocide and how they did it. And so um, I think there's definitely a generational pain that I felt. Uh, I, I grew up with a lot of physical uh, ailments or things that I just felt like I could see came from uh, you know my parents who had been through the, the Lebanese war as well uh, on top of that. So, um, you know, I think that I was really, really angry, really, really rageful at God and especially with Baba when I was like, how could this, how could you do this? You know, and I would just spend a lot of time staring into his eyes, pictures of him and, and screaming and, and rageful and swearing and just totally losing it, just completely like how, you know, just couldn't stop. And, um, and everybody was telling me things, you know, and I was reading a lot of things and, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't penetrating the, the amount of hurt and pain that I was carrying. Um, it just, was so deep, you know, and um, and one day I just had a dream with Baba where he was a, he was a kid, and I was I started screaming at him. I said, "What the what? How could you? How dare you do all this to?" Us? And then the kid just looked so hurt and scared. And then Baba turned into like a teenager, and I started screaming at the teenager, and I was like, "How dare you know?" Just so much anger. And then he got a little bit older and got a little bit older. And finally, when he got to the age of maybe, I don't know, maybe in his 60s, he, he was starting to become physically closer to me. I just tried. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but I, I was at just, the, you know, just what, had, what I felt in my body, what had been done, like you were saying, just unfathomable. You know, like God, it's just unfathomable. And it was the struggle of my mind against my heart. And Baba just rose his hands up and he just went like that. He just went like that. And everything, you know, it just was like lifetimes of pain it was, was cleaned, you know. And I just, I stopped, I stopped having that pain in my heart and in my body. And um, so I, I don't know how, for you, you know, I know that you probably understand some of what I'm saying. You feel that, and and I, I you know, Bob, bless you to to find your way with him and his his work with you to 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 clear that from your heart and to to make you feel his love and and to surrender whatever you got to surrender to to feel that peace again that you know is the truth. And um, I thank you for asking that question, you know, because it it was a it still is a very meaningful question to me. And, and I think um, a lot of people are, are asking that. So, you know, bless you. Thank you. Beautiful, Alan. Very touching. Wow. Jeff, that was 
great response. Not sure what I could add to those great responses. Uh, I was thinking along the lines of Baba's work, but it also certainly reminded me of Vishnu's explanation to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita when he's about to go to war with his brothers and slaughter his brothers uh, just to regain his kingdom, knowing that the stricture against kill, and yet he's leading the battle. And it's a marvelous passage. So if it were helpful at all, I would suggest reading that. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. That all that about projecting onto other people. <laughs> yeah, for for me again, um, knowing small, knowing that Baba handled World War Two personally, right, and Sai Baba handled World War One. Um, when we look at all of the what's and the why's and the where thoughts, right? The pain, you know, that just resonates. You heard it in Alan's voice, you heard it in others' voices, right? But at the end, at the end, the light still shines. The light still prevails. Because even though we're in duality, it emanates from singularity from the Tao, the one, the source. So yeah, we endure this stuff for sure, no doubt. We all are, one way, shape, form or another, but there's a plan, there's a plan. And the man is involved in the plan. Jay Baba, love you all. Thank you. Uh, it, was a, it was a question that keeps coming up and up and up and, and it's, it needs to come up because in our, in our lives oftentimes, well, for instance, this last section we just read was about misconceptions. So what, what are, what's being missed here? And I think Baba said there's one reason to come to me, and that's to surrender. And, and yes, that makes sense. But then we also go on living our lives and thinking about things, the coronavirus and the, the this and that, and the wars and the... Uh, it, that doesn't mean that, as I hear it anyway, it doesn't mean that Baba was saying, I want you to, to take this job, Hitler, and go do a good job. That's not at all what I hear. That's, that's a misconcept. First of all, Baba's asked us one of, one of very simple things to do. Baba, how can I love you? Think of me more. Think of me in your heart. Think of me in the morning when you first get up, at noon, at five o'clock, and when you go to bed. Now then, we want to get the questions to these, these, uh, these critical things in life that are fear-born, war. And, and this is the misconception of what the purpose of life is. It's not about having wars or not having wars. It's about loving God, to me. But we lose track of that. We, we hear when Baba said that, but then we get tied up in all these other uh, problems and everything. And, and we forget who we're supposed to love. Love thy neighbor. Wow. Does that mean that everybody's our neighbor? Yes, it does. It, 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 I should not have enemies or I should not have people I don't like. That's not what Baba was training me to do. Find the love within each. And that's, that's what this misconception was about in this chapter. So I think what I'm hearing here is, is that we're... we're we're taking the sad part of life and sometimes saying, why does it have to be sad? Why does it have to be violent? Why does it have to? It doesn't have to. It can be happy and joyous too. And I don't mean that it's a, it's a little thing that, that uh, so many people had to die. That's not a, uh, it's not a good thing right now either. But it, it's just, we, we can, we can, have a lot of time right now to spend with Baba in our hearts and, and sharing uh, amongst one another how beautiful uh, this creation is. Thanks. Yeah. 
Great. And uh, Ellie. Hi. Um, this will come quite as juicy from the heart, but a perspective that I talked with a couple other Baba women, longtime Baba women, gave me some deeper understanding from a yogic perspective. And that included that, you know, from looking at it from a very high perspective, there really is not good nor bad. You know, really, I mean, we know that we're working through our sanskaras and we don't want to have, we have to work through the good sanskaras as much as we do the so-called bad sanskaras. And I know I always thought about I had to be pure, I had to purify myself, but I'm, and that's still true on a certain level, probably not the highest level. So it's almost like there's this big play going on, again, looking from a very high perspective, a big play, and it's neither good nor bad, but it's helping us move through our sanskaras. And the whole Holocaust thing, these people were ripe. They, they got their karma, Baba gifted them and it doesn't seem like it from this perspective here. But Baba gifted them by speeding up their karma. Their next incarnation, they were a freer being or soul or whatever we call that. You know, so it was really in a different light, a gift. The karma was sped up, the sanskaras were cleared, as someone else had mentioned in a beautiful way. So that's what I took to understand. It's definitely on a I, for lack of a better word, an esoteric level of understanding. Mm, very good. Excellent. Oh, these are all great <clears throat> different pers camera angles on the same one thing. <clears throat> we have one more hand up. Janet Jacobs. Yes, I just wanted to say, and I, I appreciate the heartfelt responses and how it... Um, how it really, for me, awakened a lot of compassion. And I somehow feel like that awakened compassion is Baba's gift. And, you know, that I feel I can share in the pain of, of you know, not being Jewish and not being Armenian or black or anything in this lifetime, uh, being semi-privileged, but it's a privilege and I appreciate people's comments because I feel personally privileged by being able to share in the pain. And I don't mean like, woe is me, I mean life is horrible or anything like that, but just that heart-touching understanding of of some of the trauma that others have gone through. So I'm just thanking people. Thank you, Janet. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I think people realize tomorrow's Holocaust Memorial Day. So besides Easter and just an amazingly timely discussion. And um, I also have a little story, a lighter note that um, uh, Lynn Ott, when he used to always be so um, wild in his way of intervening in a sense. So he knew I carried great historical uh, challenge around this issue. And one day he just said to me, you know, it's really important for you to be good, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, of course. You know, and he goes, I like to be bad. And then, so, so then he says, maybe you were Hitler's daughter. What do you know? You know, and I just, he just broke through, you know, like he broke through those misconceptions that we were just talking about. And I started laughing and, you know, does obviously this is a terribly serious topic. And I do believe for me personally that I hold, like when I went to Baba's tune and I put my head down for the first time, I felt lifetimes being lifted as was described in that dream. And I think that so much of this grief and pain and other lives and all this, Baba lifted and gifted me and Lynn gifted me in a different way. And Baba's constantly helping me to become freer, but not, I never lose that sense of um, that sort of stretch towards 
between joy and sorrow, like that that's what he wants me to know, that it's all there and that I should always have that compassion and that awareness. And so to be pricked, definitely, you know, be pricked, but you know, don't fall, continue the joy that somebody mentioned earlier that there's, that the light has come on, you no? Know? For the Jews, we have a state now, you know? I have my nieces and nephews, I've never seen such amazing, bright, brilliant Jewish people in my life. And I mean, where did that come from? So I believe all of these things, this has been an amazing conversation. And uh, thanks for letting me share. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, Gabrielle's comment um, just reminded me um, there's there's a book I read recently. Some of you may have be aware of it, and I can't remember the woman's name. Um, she's about she's in her mid nineties now. She was a Holocaust survivor, and she wrote a book called The Choice, and it details what her experiences were in the Holocaust, which were really horrible. And um, and then a lot of it is about kind of the choice. It's it's really an exploration of what choices that that people have choices about how they can respond to things, including things that are horrible like the Holocaust and like that, but there's still choices that, that people have available to them. But one of the things that she says, and I think I, I just wanted to inject this into the conversation, and I think it's very much in keeping with what Baba said, but she said she was, she's a therapist. She's a Jungian analyst, I believe. And she's, she's very um, resistant to the idea of, pe of people um, gradating pain, the pain that different people go through based on their life experience. You know, she's sort of like, she said, she deals with a lot of people who are very, you know, who almost devalue their own pain because in contrast with her, it seems so trivial in nature. And she's very rejecting of that notion. She's really embracing of the notion that everyone's pain is real to them and relevant to them and should not be compared with them anybody else's. And I feel that that's also what Baba has said in so many different ways, where he said that there, that there really should be no distinctions being made about the pain that one person goes through relative to another person's pain, that all pain is, <clears throat> is unique to that person and, is, and needs to be honored for that person. So I just want to say that so that we don't, so we don't sort of separate this world into this, these are the horror shows and these things, you know, the quiet, the quiet but, but persistent pain that people go through in their daily lives, some of which lead them into depression, to suicide, to all kinds of stuff, is also very legitimate pain and that we don't, that we don't divide the world that way. So. <clears throat> yeah, speaking to Jeff, uh... Aspel, that's a magnificent book called The Choice. Uh, Dr. Edith Igor, Eger, E-G-E-R. Very powerful book in which she spent a whole lifetime overcoming the victimhood that was, that was strangling her life. And, and she, she came out the other end of it with a uh, very, very deep and loving, universally loving person in her 90s. It's well worth uh, reading that, yeah. <clears throat> I just want to say um, the, the passage that Dan's referring to is one that I recall is in the discourses, and Baba speaks specifically about one should not compare mental pain to physical pain. You know, that physical pain is often quite visible, to, to others, um, like if someone has a broken arm or if someone is blind, but Baba says that pain can be equal to anyone else's pain that is not visible. And um, I can't pr remember precisely where in the discourse it, it is, but it's a couple of pages um, in one of them, one of the chapters. Yeah. Oh. I have a... a a personal story, uh, Jeff, um, in response to your um, pain about all that. I started feeling the pain when I was a teenager when I read about the Holocaust. And then I had the opportunity to go to Germany <clears throat> in 1968, and I lived with a German family. And um, uh, one of the things I felt led to do was go to Dachau 
And of course, nobody wanted to go with me. None of the people in my German, the German family I was staying with. So I went there, I took a bus by myself to Dachau to pay respects to all the souls that had lost their lives there. Well, fast forward to India. When I go to India the first time, I feel led to, to go back to India um, for six months the following year. So in 84, I go to um, India and I'm assigned, uh, I stay for Amartithi and I'm assigned to um, be a night, kind of like a night watchman for the women in the Pandal where women are sleeping and to help them if anybody woke up in the night. Well, during that time, I had this strong feeling that I had been a woman, a, a, a women's guard in, in one of the concentration camps in Germany. And now I was being offered the opportunity to watch out for um, all these hundreds of sleeping uh, Indian women out of love. And I was so moved. And the next day I told that to Pat Sumner. And she said that other people had told her the same thing. So I felt like, and, and some of you know that when I first came to Baba, I had a lot of trouble with reincarnation, but this came to me so strong. So I offer that story uh, to you, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I was wanted to thank Alan and Jeff for for their sharing, I appreciated that. Uh, I also, on a kind of different note, I like the end of the uh, the last paragraph in the subsection about we experience the kind of projection from him in a very powerful way. The radiance of his presence is the effect of completely enveloping one's lower nature and calling forth one's higher self. And I wondered if that was kind of the response that people talk about when they talk about first experiencing Baba. Possibly. That his presence or his look or his smile just kind of suddenly enveloped them uh, and took them over in some complete fashion. Uh, it seems like that would, that would do it. And I, I wish that I'd had that experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Oh, I um, really appreciate the heartfelt response of everybody. My heart is just like really opening. And I just remembered something that I'd known, but I forgot, you know, and that is uh, so I was born in 1960, and my mother put me in a Jewish day camp. I'm Christian, and I was there for two or three years, and I was, I think, one of the only non you know, shiksa. I was one of the only shiksas there. I was the only non-Jew there, and and then um, when I went to uh, after college, I worked in medical research, and I was I almost exclusively worked with uh, Jewish scientists and uh for like 14 years and all my bosses were jewish and and um, my father was obsessed with the second world war and always had material and was looking at stuff and my brother-in-law now is, was is obsessed with the second world war and i had this really deep knowing that i was killed in the camps and of course now i'm a baba lover and I had forgot, you know, like sometimes these things we forget, you know, because I'm just living my life and everything. And um, because I had such, such identification with, you know, and I was living with all these Jewish people, you know, I've had Jewish friends, you know, just like, um, and I literally forgot it until this discussion. Um, so, yeah, I just thank you for all the compassion and also um, I sent a note to Alan that I have had two mentors who are Armenian, like major mentors, like my voice coach for 12 years, you know, who was like, don't talk to me about the Jewish Holocaust. We went through it. And, you know, cause she was, 
you know, she's deceased now, but she was in a lot of pain about it. And, um, and my improv teacher it, um, is Armenian. So it's like, you know, like I have in this lifetime, you know, identified with and been with all of these people. And then, you know, that, that glimpse like, oh, I was there, you know, I was there. And, um, but thank you, God, that I'm here with, with all of you and such heart and compassion. And of course, Bahaba with such heart and compassion. Thanks for all your shares today. <clears throat> you know, I heard uh, Eric on a number of occasions, and many of you may also have heard him. He, he said he felt that 70% of Baba's Western lovers came through the concentration camps. Hmm. Uh, I mean, he said that on a number of occasions, and he didn't normally make observations like that. But a lot of people, when I've been in India, have recovered some of those memories, those traumatic memories, uh, while they're there in dreams or, you know, in flashes. Yeah. And uh, here we are with Baba, thank God. <laughs> we have another <clears throat> hand up. Uh, Adrian, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your just absolute heart warming, heart opening shares and just really like honoring that tomorrow is Holocaust Remembrance Day. And the thing I wanted to share was just the thinking about the comment that Baba made about just kind of bringing it home here to the States, you know, that that I guess America needs my blood. We know when he got in the accident in Oklahoma, just thinking about the legacy of our own, our own country here and what we're still struggling with. And thinking of Baba, Baba is all of it. And that he suffers the most because he feels it all and we are him. And we are at war with ourselves, you know? And it's his, you know, he's pulling us like a tractor, you know, he's like a draft horse and <laughs> tilling the soil of, of his creation. And it's just so brutal, you know? Like, I remember being a teenager and <sighs> the first time I ever saw Adolf Hitler's face, and I had a panic attack in history class and I had to leave because I couldn't stop like hyperventilating. I, it was like the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen in my life. Um, and just, you know, we carry that with us. And then I remember this is a little bit of a humorous thing, but it's just like, it's all happening at the same time. But at the Southeast gathering a couple of years ago, I was just sitting in the cafeteria. And I think I might've told this story before because I think it's really funny, but I was just, looking at everyone and thinking about how important it is to me as a person to like make people laugh and make people smile and how the Baba community has been such a, like, I feel so responsible for everyone's happiness and I just love everyone so much. And it's like, I just occurred to me that that was kind of, not everyone feels that way, you know? And then I thought, I had this thought like, I was probably like a mass murdering dictator in a past life. And this is like, I mean, really, like we don't know who we are. Like just cause I'm not doing that now doesn't mean I didn't come through that like Genghis Khan style. And, that, and it's not to like make light of it, but just to say that like, we are like Darwin saying like we are big, we are really big. We have lived millions of lifetimes. We have loved and killed and you know, laughed and whatever, been tortured. And it's like really hard being human and that it, it has to be hard. Otherwise we wouldn't ever want to stop and we would just keep doing it. And at a certain point it exhausts us to the point where we get broken down and can finally, finally surrender. And that is why it is so sweet to get to that surrender, to get to that place where we're done. Like, oh my God. I can't believe we just went through that. And um, I just feel really, we're, we're, so, we're so privileged. Like Janet was saying, you know, we're privileged just to be with each other and love Baba. I mean, that is just, we hit the jackpot, even just to know his name, you know, that's just, that's it, that is it. And we can hold on to that, you know, through all of it. And 
everyone else's comments were just absolutely just incendiary. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Hey, so we should probably have a few moments of silence here um, <clears throat> before we go on. J Baba. Oh, wow. That's really. <clears throat> yeah, my God. It's the hardest thing to grapple with all of this. Uh, Dan Ladinsky uh, <clears throat> was used to stay at Marizad from time to time. And, you know, normally when we would uh, go, the pilgrims would go out to Mar Marizad, uh, Erich and Mani and all the Mandali would be there and they'd embrace you and say, Jay Baba, Angela, Jay Baba, Ruth, Jay Baba, Judy, and everything. And we'd, you know, people would line up and, <clears throat> and then eventually we'd go into Mandali Hall. But on Baba's birthday, they, their, their tradition was to, to uh, be in Baba's bedroom at five in the morning. And the, the, the whatever re Western residents were there and, and the mo women Mondali and men Mondali. And on that occasion, after they would say Avatar Mayor Baba seven times, Erich would go around and he would embrace each one and he would say, I love you, Baba. You mm. go to the next one. I love you, Baba. Mm. I love you, Baba. Everyone is Baba in disguise, you might say. But he didn't do that, you know. I mean, that he didn't do that out on the veranda, <laughs> you know. But that's what he, that was his experience. And you really felt that he really knew you because he knew Baba so well, he, he knew us, yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, that's referring to the, the, the misprojection. <laughs> May her Baba, Lord and friend, my beloved to the end. May her Baba, ancient one, you shine brighter than a million suns. May her Baba, avatar, keeper of the key to my locked up heart. Oh, and may her the only one who really could love you as you should be loved. I sing your glory to the stars. Oh, Mehra, Meher, Baba. Oh, Mehra, Meher, Baba. How can I love you as you deserve? Oh, the fire inside me burns. How can I see you as you are? When my eyes, they never look that far. Oh, the glory of your name I cannot describe I cannot explain when I'm broken all I need to say is Meher Baba and then I write his reign I sing your glory 
to the star. Oh, Mehra, Meher, Meher Baba. 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 Meher Baba, Lord and friend, my beloved to the end. Jai, Jai, Jai. Thank you, Jai Baba. Yeah.